and welcome to the PhotoFocus Podcast. My name is Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of PhotoFocus.com, a great website where you can get inspiration and education about photography every single day. We've got a great episode today where we're going to explore several topics that will help you improve your photography. You're going to learn practical advice about portrait photography, get some tips on editing your photos of people, and importantly, learn some strategies to get back to work during COVID and how to safely take pictures of other people during these tough times. We've got two great guests today. Mike Cabasi, who's a Hollywood photographer working on several popular TV shows and movie sets, and Christina Shirk, a portrait photographer and retoucher. Before we jump into the episode, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank a few of our partners. Be sure to check out Exire Search and Photo. It brings the ability to search for your images using artificial intelligence. There's no need to tag or keyword. You could find the perfect photo by using intelligent searches, much like a Google search. It automatically recognizes the content, subject, and other key factors about your pictures. Learn more at exire.com. Also, be sure to check out Exposer. They've got a great series of frames that make it simple to swap out images and hang your photos in great prints on the wall so you and others can enjoy them. All right, let's jump into the interview with our first guest. It's Christina Shirk, retoucher and portrait photographer. Christy, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's always great to catch up. It's been a while since we've had you on the show. You make your living both shooting photos and editing photos. So I have to ask, which part do you enjoy more, the shooting or the editing? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, at this point, I enjoy different aspects of each. So for the editing stuff, the, just the sheer creativity and the fact that you have like complete control over you know, what you're creating, like that's really fun for the editing part. Um, and then the other thing that I like about editing is, is that when I train and when I teach people the whole editing thing and the Photoshop thing, it just, it helps, uh, it just revitalizes me to, you know, help bridge the gap between the translation that it requires in order to learn Photoshop. It, it is really like learning a language. And so anything that I can do to kind of help people out, I really enjoy. It just like has a little special place in my heart. And, and then when it comes to photography in general and shooting and being behind the camera, I really enjoy meeting new people. And every time you show up at a new shoot, you have a different set of issues that you need to resolve and create something out of. So it's a little bit exhilarating, you know, like you show up blind to a location and you have to make something pretty out of it. I, I think that's a perfect answer. So, you know, you, you re-emphasize the point for me that I think a lot of folks miss, which is you have to be balanced. As a photographer, we owe it to ourselves to know how to post process because it's become such an important part. But the creativity and the act of coming up with something is truly important during the shooting stage as well. So let's start on the shooting side. When you're getting ready, you shoot a lot of portraits. What sort of steps do you do ahead of time to make sure you're ready for that photo shoot? Is there any research you do or anything related to your subject or how do you stay fresh? I should probably do a little bit more research. What I've tried to automate as much as possible in terms of our business and scheduling appointments and everything like that. And that came with a new website as well. And um, so one of the things that was really important was using um, – my back end, uh, 17 hats. And it has the option for, you know, sending a questionnaire to your subjects. And, and, and that's really been helpful because it allows me to have all of the data for a shoot in one location and one PDF. And so, you know, what time do you want us to arrive? What time do you want to start shooting the headshots? What time, what is the, what is the background that you want us to bring with us? And it's just like, what is the location of the shoot? And so it allows us to have one piece of information that we can just reference really quickly when we're sh showing up at a, at a location because what ended up happening was we 
we're getting so busy in terms of shooting headshots for corporate companies downtown in Washington, D.C., that we just really needed to streamline our organizational stuff instead of all those emails back and forth with clients. Well, what do you want? When do you want to start? When? How much time do you need for each person? You know, When do I tell my clients to show up? All of those things that can just be taken care of with one questionnaire, one PDF. Do you still find that clients want some personal touch or do you still have an opportunity for them to engage with you if this automated process doesn't give them everything they need or they have questions? Yeah. I think the easiest way for us to do that as prof- as photographers is to have them send us like inspirational images of what they want the final image to look like. Because unfortunately, the vocabulary that corporate clients use um, when they are trying to get you know, an image that they have in their head and get it translated out onto paper. It's extremely frustrating if they're not using the right terminology, the right language. So when they say, I want something that's snappy, like that doesn't mean anything to you as a photographer. But if you have an image that they're using as an inspiration or or that you're trying to match on their website, um, that's something that can easily be taken care of by just showing a couple inspirational images to you as a photographer. Because you can deduce from that like what the lighting was. You can deduce where the, the angles were. If it's soft lighting, if it's extra like blown out, if the shadows are super bright and airy and stuff like that, or if everything's super crunchy and they've really crunched the blacks um, and, and you know, they're using grids on all of their lights so that it doesn't fall off onto anything else and it's just on the subject. It's like... Because the client would say something like, I want the picture to look bright and that could mean harsh lighting or outdoor lighting or bright soft soft lighting, you know, bright is not a description that helps a photographer understand, but totally. visually show me what you want probably makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So as you start to, you know, build this plan out, you're getting ready to shoot. One of the things that we've clearly seen is technology continues to evolve both in our cameras and in our computers, making it easier to fix things, making it easier to solve problems. Let's start, for example, with with just the makeup side of things. There's so much that, you know, one can do on set to make the subject look good, to cut down on shine, to get the attractive light. But it's also become easier than ever to remove blemishes or remove shine in post. Do you try to get it perfect in camera? Do you try to get it as good as possible and know that you've got a safety net? How do you approach this balance of what you try to do on set versus what you're comfortable fixing later? I think it all boils down to the description of the job. And the and what I mean by that is when I'm retouching for my corporate retouching clients out in LA and I'm not doing the photography for them, they are paying me a premium price to to take care of all of those things. But when I'm shooting my own work down in DC, they're not paying me for advertising level retouching. They're paying me off of the quality of the work on my site. And so anything that I can do to speed up the retouching time on my end, including using AI technology, including using all of those face aware types of things and plugins, that is what I want to do for that work. It really depends. But but would I ever use um, AI technology? AI technology on a on a huge ad campaign for, you know, a skin a, a skin care brand. Probably not because my job description is different on those two different things. Sure. So there's, you know, there's different approaches and it all comes down to trust. I mean, obviously your reputation there is as the retoucher and you're taking great care to go through However, you know, even a tool like a content aware brush is ultimately using some AI. If you use that to touch up, you're just choosing where to manually apply it. You don't see these things as cheating, do you? You know, is do you have to go in and manually sample the colors yourself and brush up to remove that piece of acne, or is it okay to use a content aware brush to take it out? Oh yeah, it's totally okay. I, I, yeah, sorry. I think, um, I was speaking a little bit too broadly there, but, um, you, you're not comfortable with batch automating a large client yeah. job if you're specifically being hired yeah. to be the retoucher. Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. But a lot of photographers feel that that's cheating. 
you know, they, they somehow feel that if you didn't get it perfect in camera, even though the camera itself, you know, I, I, I meet a lot of photographers who forget that autofocus is a relatively modern invention and that raw files with 16 bit dynamic range, which we're starting to see coming in cameras now is, you know, changes the rules of what one can do in camera and what one can do in post. How do you balance this out? Is it about the results? Do clients ever really care about the tech or do they just care about what you create? No. Yeah. They don't care about how you get to your end product. And and to compound that, to, to kind of build on that, you you are an artist at the end of the day as a photographer. And it really doesn't matter what programs or or artistic avenues you take to get to your end product, whatever it is, it's fine. I have this one class that I taught about the top 10 mistakes beginner photographers make and how to fix them in Photoshop because I actually, I fell into my Photoshop major in college. I, I wasn't a photography major. I was, a, I, I majored in digital art and in Photoshop. So all of the, all of the problems that you, <laughs> that you approach when you're beginning photography, I fixed in Photoshop and yeah, it took me a lot longer, but that was the that was the technology that I knew how to fix it in. I didn't know how to fix it in camera when I was first starting out. And so I really live by the mantra of whatever you're using to create your art is, is your choice. And it doesn't make you any less of a photographer if, if it's not captured all in camera. Like a bunch of my underwater mermaid stuff a lot of folks don't know that you you capture, just to preface that for those who aren't familiar, yeah. <laughs> you take great portraits of people that are um, doing high-end costumes, dressed as mermaid, mermen, doing underwater photography where you actually shoot underwater, you guys are diving or snorkeling and, and creating these great underwater photo shoots. Yes. Yeah. In the middle of the Bahamas, which is like amazing. Um, I could use some Bahamas right about now. Yeah, yeah. I think we all need to get out there and and uh, one one week a year, I stop photographing the people in monkey suits downtown in Washington D.C. and I fall in love with photography all over again and do the the interesting stuff of um, of of underwater photography. But uh, but a lot of those shots. So just to finish my thought a lot of those shots are are composites they are the you know the the top portion of the body from one image and maybe the hair from another image and maybe the right tail position from a third image it doesn't mean you didn't take it because you took all those shots you just took them at different times and i don't think that that should be a a a, a point against any photographer with whatever they use to create their images and their art. Yeah, it makes sense that we are open to flexibility, that we want to be creative and make changes. Now, with the post-production side, I think a lot of people struggle because we have so many choices and there is no one right, correct answer. You know, some of us spend a lot of time tweaking the raw file and trying to get a good starting point. And then we'll go into Photoshop and work with layers and might touch into a third party plugin to solve a problem or to speed up part of that process. Other people, you know, feel that they're deadline driven and just try to do everything in Lightroom. It doesn't mean that one is correct and one is wrong, but I, I see people who seem to figure out their post-production and then cross that off their list. Like they learned how to edit seven years ago. They've got a workflow and they don't change it. And I look at how much they're missing out on because they just become frozen in time. Yet they continue to pay for updates to their software and all of these great fixes that they never use. How, this just drives me nuts. I, I know you do a lot of instruction on this. Do you have any advice to people on how to kind of embrace a newer, more modern workflow and what that might look like? I think it's tough because people they get in their habit. We're we're all intrinsically wired to to want to streamline and to 
work as proficiently as possible, especially when you're a professional photographer, because the amount of hours you put into a job, the the more that number grows, the less you get paid per hour for that job. And so we're all trying to streamline and, uh, you know, as much as possible. And then when you get something done and you get something that works, then it's kind of like, do I want to take the time to pull it all apart? You know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. If, do I really want to take the time to pull it all apart and build it up so that I can get a more proficient, um, proficient, streamlined um, workflow? And the answer is you have to make that commitment, but that it is worth it in the end because I guarantee you, like I have a class on actions and how you can literally have Photoshop do 80% of the things that you do for, let's say, portrait retouching specifically. Um, You can have actions that set up all of your layers. You can have actions that do your skin smoothing for you. You have actions that can... um, sharpen, you know, your images and that kind of thing. And, and I, I can only see within the next five years, Photoshop is really going to start advancing their AI into even more of the face aware stuff. They're going to really advance out the face aware liquify stuff. And that's a perfect example of what we're talking about is the new implementations of AI and, um, into the liquify dialog box. You now have sliders that literally will find the nose, will narr- like f- they will yeah, find you the can, chin. You can still manually control things, but what you don't have to do is manually select things. It's able to identify features and Photoshop and others have that. So instead of saying, I want to, you know, slightly shift the nose or I need to pull out the dark circles under the eyes, you don't have to paint where the eyes are. It knows what's an eye, what's a nose. So that's a perfect example of embracing the new features in order to make your life easier and your retouching easier. And I think that's important to touch into. I Now, people struggle with this, but you know, let's take it back to that end result. These days, you know, there's a lot of grief uh, around retouching of photos. I think I, there's a lot of examples of bad retouching. There's a lot of examples of people not understanding maybe the intent or the goal of how the subject wants to look in a picture. What's the moral responsibility and professional responsibilities you have when you are retouching photos? Are there things that you keep in mind, uh, you know, your client's feedback or the subject's feedback? How do you balance that? I think that there are like a short list of things that we always kind of cover in retouching. So, you know, under eye circles, softening the lines. We don't go too far on that. Uh, Getting rid of blemishes. If it's a, if it's a freckle on the skin, that's more than 50% visible, then I leave it. Um, Same with moles and everything like that. If it's less than 50% visible, I kind of may get rid of it, get rid of it. Um, it's just so crazy because you totally get the gamut of clients. You get clients who come in and just say, no, I think that looks fabulous the way it is. And so you kind of have to read between the lines with them and you have to say, okay, I'm not going to go kind of crazy on retouching on this one. But then you get the clients that are looking at their images and they're very silent and they're quiet and they say, oh, it's not you, it's me. I'm just, I'm really unhappy with the way that I look. Your photography's great. You know, it's just, I, I'm not, I'm unhappy with the way that I look in the photo. And at that point, what I usually do to, to those clients is I say, can you verbalize to me what it is that you're unhappy with? And if they say, oh, well, my nose is too big. I don't, I don't like the way that my lo- nose looks, or I don't like the wrinkles here. Then I can say to them, I can happily get rid of those things for you in the photograph if it's going to make you like the photograph more. But the thing the thing that you need to remember as a photographer is not to jump in and say, oh, well, if you want me to clean it up, I could do this or I could do that or I could clean up your skin or I could um, bring in your jawline a little or the sides of your face a little. The, those are things that it's super important that the client has to say to you first At that point, you can say, oh, well, I can easily fix that for you if you'd like. 
but it's not your job to tell the client what's wrong with their face. And I see that sometimes. I see photographers telling people to fix their face. And I just think that's just the worst. In my mind, that's just the worst thing that you can say to a client. Yeah. You need them to identify. I mean, you know, any portrait of mine, I just, you know, wow, I have dark circles under my eyes. It doesn't matter how much I sleep. So I don't mind lightening that. And it's no different than if I had the option, you know, of a makeup artist on set, that would be something that I'd ask the makeup artist to fix. Just like I would say, as someone who, as I get older, continues to be follically challenged, hey, can you reduce the shine on the top of my head? Or if you're lighting my portrait, can we not put a super strong backlight on the top of my head? These are the things that, you know, are, are normal pieces of feedback because different lighting could hide that, you know, if just yeah. the way that the photo was shot could have hidden those shadows or could have minimized those dark circles or made it more attractive. So I see that being an opportunity in post to either correct things that were miscommunicated or to enhance things that a simply change in lighting would have changed when you shot the picture. You can minimize wrinkles by how you light the photograph. And that makes the person feel very different. Just like harsh lighting could add 10 or 15 years to a person oh, yeah, by totally. how you light their portrait. Mm -hmm. So do you communicate these things before the shoot, after the shoot? Do you kind of get them to describe anything that they'd like to see with the photo before you show them the picture? Or do you wait until they've reacted to start, you know, making these changes based on their feedback? I usually wait because, you know, when somebody walks in, like you can kind of tell if there is something that you think that they're going to be self-conscious about. Sometimes you can tell, you know, and so you can do it in camera. You can make those changes. You can like on and somebody who maybe ma makes a mention of something like, oh, man, you know, before before this year, uh, you know, I was 15 pounds lighter. So I, You're going to get rid of that those 15 pounds for me, aren't you? I mean, every photographer has heard it. Right. Um, in that kind of situation, I would go posing, posing, posing. Get that sure. pose right Let's in camera. Let's get that chin up a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and out towards camera too, like the turtle thing, you know? Um, and then, uh, and then see how far that goes, see how far that gets you. Like if I have a CEO of a company come in and he's, um, a little bit on the shorter side, I'm going to crouch down and I'm going to photograph him from below, which will give the illusion that he's taller in the photo. And then they'll be like, oh, this is a great picture. They don't know why it's a great picture. But they you know. know that they like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that no, that makes total sense. Evaluating the scene, evaluating your subject. As we're working with projects right now, obviously, you know, a lot of people are are looking to add professional shooting to their thing. They'd like to make some money off of photography. A lot of pros have faced challenges. You know, this has certainly been a tough time in the economy. We've all faced it. We've all seen downturns. What do you think are some of the most important business practices or best advice you'd have, whether you're just getting started or you're trying to reinvigorate your business? What have been some of the hallmarks that keep you having loyal customers or help you find business? Do you have any practical advice you could share for folks? I would recommend taking a really good hard look at your SEO for your website. Sure. So the search engine optimization, how do people find your site? What sort of tags and keywords and descriptions are in there that people would discover you through search? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's... Any, any resources I, for that that you find helpful? Or do you recommend, you know, hiring somebody to help you analyze that? Or is that something you do yourself? I, I have chosen to kind of do it uh, mostly myself, but then I have like a guru come in. I, there's a great photographer that actually teaches SEO for photographers. Rob Greer is his name. Uh, and he does like virtual workshops where you can actually learn how to, inc how to increase the SEO on your site. Um, that would be one thing. And then the other thing is that taking this downtime to streamline and optimize your your workflows, uh, whether that's on the retouching side or whether that's on the front paperwork, you know, onboarding side for the clients, doing as much as you can now because we all know that when this lets up, 
it's going to be, we're, we are all going to absolutely kill ourselves because we have a year of not doing photography to make up and we're going <laughs> to, we're going to work ourselves to exhaustion because it's feast or famine, right? right? If you do anything during this time, learn actions, learn how you're going to better do your day-to-day stuff moving forward. Think about like a scheduling app incorporate I can't tell you how many like in 2018 right I would have on average five or six emails back and forth with clients about scheduling a session oh no I can't do that time can you do this date and this time no no I can't do that what about this date and this time okay um oh yeah let me check with somebody let me check with the makeup artist and then I'll get back to you get a scheduling app send them a link let them schedule their own you know, that was so much easier than the back and forth. And I have to wait for this person to finish responding so I can get back to this person because they had first dibs. And it's just amazing that change. And I noticed like with SEO, you know, if I search for, you know, DC headshots, you come up number one, also because you went with a URL of WashingtonDCHeadshots.com. And so you've got everything in there throughout the site about portrait photography, headshots, book now, you make it very easy for people to decide that they want to hire you, which I imagine is important. I, I notice, for example, that you you know you give them very straightforward pricing, including different options that they can choose from. But you know this is kind of the change these days, right? People are used to going on to Amazon or you know oh I want to order food tonight. They could browse dozens of menus and options right from their computer without ever talking to someone. Yeah, talking to I imagine people. this changes the sales process from what it used to be. Oh yeah. I get an email in my email box, in my inbox. It says, Hey, somebody's booked an appointment with you. This is the session that they've booked. They've added on rush retouching for retouched images within 24 hours. They've added on makeup and hair. And, um, they, this is the background that they want. This is their inspirational image that they've uploaded. Um, and here's all their contact information and, and it's all in an email for me. And, you know, and, and then payment stuff too. They're able to pay right when they book. So it, it, it has alleviated tons of headache and tons of logistical back and forth. And it's allowed us to really focus on the time with the client. And then also the really nice thing is that if we have that image that's been uploaded that they love, that they want to try and mimic, then we can set up the lighting before they even get in. Like if they want something, you know, that's really nice and airy with a bright background, then I know how to set up the lights. And so they come in and we get them their shot and they're they're shocked at how fast it happens because you're prepared for them. And, And I noticed that you've also adjusted and are explaining to clients how you can photograph with COVID-19. You've made adjustments to yourself, you wearing a mask, sanitizing the equipment, offering outdoor photo shoots and open air photo shoots. Have these modifications been important? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure this has to be on the potential customer's mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had a client call me the other day and said, I can't believe I have to ask this, but are you going to be wearing a mask during the shoot? And I said, of course. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm so glad because I just got off the phone with another photographer who actually got mad at me because they said they can't do their job as a photographer, if they're wearing a mask. And I, my, my brain just blew up because that. I mean, if it was covering the eyes maybe, but. <laughs> exactly. Like it just makes every photographer that's trying their hardest to make a living. It just, it just reflects b- badly on all of us. And I was so upset to hear that. And um, yeah, I mean, putting that out there, making sure that your clients are feel at ease when they walk through the door is so important, especially now, especially now. It's the only thing putting, putting money in our, in our bank accounts and putting food on our tables. You have to make sure that your clients feel comfortable. And we do everything here to make sure that they feel comfortable, especially like I bought a second monitor, um, that is mirroring my computer screen and it's got a six foot cord. And so 
I'm one foot away from the laptop and they're one foot away from the secondary monitor and we're looking at the exact same things. They have their mask on. I have my mask on. Um, And I I, I found some cool tools that way, even for field now, there's a whole line of bus powered USB monitors that are like the thickness of a laptop, but just run off of your USB cable. So you don't even have to have a power supply for them. And it's a great picture. They're lightweight and you can do all sorts of things so that everyone can monitor on set without having to all stand around the same screen. Yeah. 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 Tech- I think I have one of those too. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're great. I mean, this technology continues to evolve and make it easier. Well, speaking of continuous involvement and making things easier, you also have a bunch of training out there and resources. What are some of the newest things that you've recently finished or have in the works that you'd like people to check out? Uh, some of your products or some of your training that you make available that people should uh, explore if they want to get better or want to save some time? I have about 40 hours of content that's going to be coming out soon, all about Photoshop and Lightroom and how to speed up your retouching. I say if if I'm not teaching you how to do something faster and at at a better quality, then it's not worth like then I'm not doing my job. And so I can guarantee you that every single one of those classes, there's 25 classes in the whole set. And every single one of those classes is going to teach you an easier way to do something that you've been frustrated with in the past. And so um, the way that you would find out about that when it launches is to go to sharkpixel.com slash store and download any of the free items that I have on that store. And there's over 200 $200 $200 worth of free stuff that's um, that's on sharkpixel.com slash store. And it's everything from brushes to notes on how to retouch skin better and free actions on setting up layers for frequency separation, all of those kinds of things. And you can download them from the site. Um, and then you'll also be notified uh, when all of the training comes out, which should be uh, in a couple of weeks now. I do encourage people to check that out. And I, I you do have a wonderful collection of, of freebies up there to inspire people as well as some great training. And you also have some training in other libraries that people can check out. So I do encourage them to look at it. You, you've got just such a perfect balance of, of things that really help people, people feel comfortable. And while I know Photoshop is your tool of choice, you've also got some great training that's sort of, I would call it bridge training for people who haven't moved beyond Lightroom yet even there showing them what they could do to, to improve things that they could still do quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, um, I have a great LinkedIn learning course, which is, um, all about the fact that you do not need to go into Photoshop anymore to do portrait retouching. And I know that that's a tall ask and that's a very, you know, that's a, you know, that's a serious statement, but, um, with the advances that have come out in Lightroom and um, using the local adjustment brush, it is absolutely possible. And this, the kind of stuff that you could learn from just that one course is going to really blow your mind. It's, it's. I liken it to the same amount of time we should be spending at the gym each week as a minimum, or at least exercising. That doesn't have to be at the gym, but you know, you really need to get in four days a week, a half hour at a time. And if people would just do that and say, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm going to just carve out half an hour. And I'm going to, instead of multitasking, the only multitasking I'm going to do is I'm going to eat my lunch, drink a cup of coffee and watch 30 minutes of training or listen to a podcast for 30 minutes. If people added that 30 minutes of education on a daily basis, four times a week, the progress they would make is immense. But the problem is, is that people binge this. They go, Oh, I, you know, I've got time or I need to do this. I don't feel caught up to date. And then they try to intake 16 hours of information in a weekend and they wonder why it doesn't stick. Yeah. So absolutely. Excellent. You shared some great resources there. So shark pixel is your primary website. If people want to see some of your uh, portraits or just explore your work, where's another good place for them to go? I also have an Instagram account with just shark underscore pixel. And so they could uh, check me out on there. But um, but yeah, the, all the free uh, items and downloadable assets and stuff for Lightroom and Photoshop are on sharkpixel.com slash store. Excellent. Well, folks, be sure to check that out. You'll also find some uh, guest posts over at Photo Focus on Christy if you want to check out some of her work and be sure to visit her website. Just some great resources there to help you take your portrait photography in a whole new way. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do it. 
A big thanks to Christina Shirk for sharing all of that practical advice and helping us learn more about portrait photography and some strategies for getting back to work during COVID. I'd like to thank two more of our partners before we go on to our next interview. First up is Tamron. If you're looking for some great options for lenses and you need to really just expand your photographic choices, Tamron makes lenses for most popular cameras. You'll find a variety of different lenses, including some for new mirrorless cameras. This makes it so easy for you to just change up your photography. And they have several unique offerings that really go a long way into opening up new creativity. And speaking of creativity, if you'd like to try the power of artificial intelligence to enhance your images, solve problems, as well as explore several creative filters that you'll find nowhere else, make sure you check out Luminar AI. Luminar works as both a plugin for Photoshop, Lightroom Classic, and Photos for Mac OS, as well as a standalone application. Be sure to head on over to photofocus.com where you could click over to all of our partners. By visiting the site and clicking our links, you help support this podcast and the dozens of articles we publish each week. While you're over at Photofocus, be sure to check out our new community for photo sharing, networking, challenges, and other great social aspects to help you connect with other photographers. Okay, let's check in with Mike Cabasi. Mike is a Hollywood photographer known for his work on the NCIS TV series, but he also works in a variety of other shows and movies and is going to share with us what it's like trying to get back to work during times of COVID. Hi, this is Rich Harrington, and we're sitting down today with Mike Cabasi, who is a Hollywood photographer. Mike's been working out in Hollywood since the 80s and has worked on a variety of projects. And we're going to talk a little bit about this style of photography, as well as since Hollywood is one of the first industries to get back to working, some of the things he's learned as we come out of COVID and start to get back to work. So, Mike, how are you doing? Glad to have you here. Happy New Year, Richard. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Excellent. So. So, Mike, as you, you know, you've been at this for a while. There's a lot that happens in Hollywood where there's a need for photography, but not everyone may think about this. What are some of the ways that a photographer might work in Hollywood? What sort of tasks are they asked to do in the entertainment industry? There's basically three tasks or needs. One is publicity, the unit photographer who goes and works on set. He doesn't light anything. He uses whatever available light the company is using. If they like the scene, he shoots the scene and he's just shooting the interaction of the actors and the the actual thing that's happening, whether it be a special effects explosion or whatever it may be. Uh, then you have the galleries when you when they need a poster or magazine cover or something like that uh, to help publicize the movie or TV. And then finally, they have the production stills. When you're watching a TV show, and the cop pulls a picture out of his jacket and says, have you seen this person? That photo is actually a production still. Uh, most uh, people know uh, I work on NCIS. And when Gibbs is interrogating somebody and he'll throw some eight by tens on the table and show the dead guy from autopsy, those are pictures I would generate. But then we also do it where it's, it's just digital playback nowadays. It's a, it, the screen comes up of the victim or of the surveillance photos and things like that. Yeah, so, sort of sort of making it the props that get used exactly. in the project. It, that's exactly what it is. On uh, some shows, you're hired by the prop master, and on the NCIS franchise, I'm hired by the post production producer. With this in mind, as you you're approaching this, you know Hollywood is mostly back to work now because the entertainment industry uh, is a, a pretty well regulated area. You know, there's a lot of safety protocols in place. Um, you know. You've been working through COVID. How has COVID affected the uh, the photography process? Uh, you know, what sort of changes have you had to make, and what sort of safety things are you seeing in place as you are getting back to work on set? Well, they, they break it down into three categories. You're you're either on a what is referred to on NCIS the green team, which means you have access to the actors. Uh, there's an orange team, which you interact with the actors, but you don't have to be there when they're filming. Oh, and then blue, you're, you're basically, you're part of the crew, but you're not part of the production end of it. You might be a teamster, someone in the office, something like that. Depending on your categories, I have to get tested uh, minimum four times a week. 
as much as obviously five times a week to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm safe to be around, you know, our actors, the talent, uh, where others might only get tested twice a week uh, or once a week. It's difficult because you're used to putting your camera, your eye to the eye cup and, and, and shoot your thing. But now you're almost having to handle it like you would watch an amateur with a digital camera. They don't, they never even lift up the camera to their face. They kind of look at the, the screen on the back. And thus far, I would say 99% of the time I have a face shield on plus mouth protection. So it makes it frustrating. You know, so you're channel- learning how to shoot in live view all over again. Exactly. And I will tell you this, I shoot with Fuji's and their facial tracking is unbelievable. It has made my job so much easier with this live tracking. Their their technology, a big plug for Fuji, uh, it, it, it's it's fantastic. I've regained my confidence in what I'm shooting because there have been times that I remember I was shooting about three months ago, two months ago, and I actually went to the producer. I said, you know, I need to, I might want to reshoot some of this stuff because I just don't feel comfortable with the depth of field and, and just what you need. I want to emphasize the shots you need. And he's like, you know, I don't, don't worry about it. These are, don't even worry about it. And, and he was fine. And when he looked at what we shot, he was totally satisfied. But I just was very uncomfortable until he said it was okay, just because of the pace we work at and the way I had to shoot it. So obviously you're having to, to learn to shoot with these safety protocols. This is a change, but for photographers who want to get back to work in commercial settings, you bring up a good point. You might need to actually put on that protection equipment and go practice a little bit so you're ready when you show up. It's not just going to be back to work to normal, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I know. oh my goodness. I'm a very, and I hope you don't know this, but you probably do because of the mutual friends we have. I'm very confrontational. You know, I mean, I, I like to think I'm a loving, humble guy, but you push the button, I'm going to get in your face, you know? And uh, when they said, no, you can't, you have to do this. I'm like, come on, man, give me a break. I, how do you want me to do this? And the swivel backs help you shoot low and high and kind of help you. Whereas before, you know, you'd have to put your eye to the camera. You you, you know what? You ha- If you're going to work, you got to adapt. It's it, That's basically what it is. You have to keep your hands clean. Uh, you have to, you have to have a good attitude, um, and, and adapt, adapt and conquer as they say. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're back to work. This makes sense. And, you know, do you have any other advice? You know, you mentioned, you know, obviously Fuji, a lot of other mirrorless cameras, we've seen great improvements with facial tracking. Has there been any other changes to your technique that have been brought out about by these new shooting conditions or any other new skills or recent skills that you're finding yourself relying upon more? One of the other things I have to do before when I would shoot ID photos and some gallery portraits and things like that, uh, now I have to be a minimum of 12 feet away and, you know, you lock your camera down. So, you know, before I just pick up my camera, go and shoot the, the actor accordingly. But now the camera's got to be locked down uh, so that people aren't handling it. I'm the only one that's on my camera and you have to have 12 feet to shoot the talent. So if you're doing a lighting setup, and you need that 12 feet space between you and the actor. Sometimes where I could have shot in a, a 10 or 12 foot space, now I need something like as much as 20 feet of space to shoot. Now, granted, it's a, it's a television studio, movie studio, so there's plenty of room, but you just have to adapt better to that space. Before you would take the camera, you'd click on the replay and you know sh- pass it off to different people, make up and here, here, look, 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 this is all good. Uh, We don't use tethering that much when we're on the set just because of the pace of the shooting. So they're looking at the back of the camera. And now it's basically, if you're not looking over my shoulder when we're doing it, it, you just, you can't be near the camera because of the the transfer potential, you know, the whole COVID thing. So, Well, maybe some of the wireless tethering technology or the, you know, the ability to share, I think we're seeing more of those options and, and that'll change. And, you know, I think it's interesting how situations are affecting things. So now this need to shoot on longer lenses and this need for face tracking and right. some of these changes to your photography. Now, obviously, lots of changes happen through the years. What are some of the things that you think if a photographer wants to stay relevant, you know, you've managed to have an effective working professional career for many years. 
What are some of the, the changes that you think have been most important in the last couple of years that photographers need to embrace so that they can stay relevant and keep working? The most significant change in my career was going digital. The current, but that was in the late 90s. Uh, nowadays, I think, Richard, is, is you got to have a good attitude. I, this, I just uh, I mentioned to you uh, earlier, I recently just booked on a movie and the producer friend of mine says, I need you to do what you always do, your great work, but I also need you to bring on your sweetness. And when someone tells you that, you're like, well, what does that mean? You know, I mean, are you saying I have a bad attitude and you want me to change my attitude? Or when you say sweetness, what do you mean? And he told me that the movie they had just completed a lot of people were getting irritable with each other because of the restrictions of COVID. Uh, and I totally understand that because, you know, we've experienced that on the two NCIS shows. And now everybody's dialed in and they know what they're doing and they expect the way of doing it. But uh, I, I think that's that might be what he was referring to, to just have a good attitude because it's it's challenging. Let's go on to that point for a moment. Well, then we'll then we'll keep digging into more. You know, those interpersonal skills are incredibly important. A lot of times, photographers like to think it's about their art or their creativity. You're working in a place where the photography is part of a team sport. You've got multiple folks shooting imagery. You've got directors. You got director of photography. So you know you need to fit into the creative process. And you also need to make those around you enjoy working with you. And so I think, you know, you bring up some good point there that the photographer's attitude to working with others is probably becoming increasingly important in a lot of sets. Huge, huge. It, it was always big for just the cr a crew member, because think about it. You're working together five days a week, 12 hours a day. So if, if you don't fit in, you don't last long. But now, the first day back on NCIS a few months ago, here we are with our, with our face masks on, our mouth protection, and I was one of my friends, I won't mention his name, we got next to each other and we did a selfie. And then I'm thinking, damn, I can't post this because we're not six feet apart. You know, <laughs> and we're basically incriminating ourselves. So where the, the horseplay and the fun of being together for 12 hours a day, you're going down a different avenue now. It's, got to, it's still professional. Like it used to, you can't high five, there's no handshaking and things like that. Uh, so yes, your, your attitude has to be really good and you got to just accommodate and be patient. And, and yet when it's your turn, you got to have your A game on and you know, they don't wait for you. You have to perform. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's challenging, but you know, you got to do it. Now, as you, you know, you see this, I'm sure, you know, I don't want to name any other photographers here, but you've seen a lot of photographers want to probably make it in Hollywood or work. I know that there's a certain perception of glamour or interest because we all have an interest in movies and entertainment, or at least many of us do. What are some of the behaviors, though, or skills that make somebody succeed at this work? And what are some of the things that are self-destructive that'll quickly get you uh, kicked off a set or not hired for the next job to get you off the set when you don't when they tell you you have a call time of 7 a.m that doesn't mean you're parking your car at 7 a.m that means cameras in hand on the set ready to go at 7 a.m i've told people many many times uh if if you're on time you're late i'm always there at least a half hour early i get myself settled and that can simply be, you know, getting a cup of coffee, getting my equipment loaded out of my truck to get to the stage that I'm shooting on, getting everything together. If you're late, you're done. Just don't even bother asking about tomorrow's work. The other thing is an attitude. You have to have a good attitude because things are constantly changing. I can show somebody how to shoot and I'm not, you know, I'm not scared. I mean, you, you're, you've been an instructor for many, many years. I can teach someone to do what I do and I'm not scared to do it because I know they don't have my personality. They might have a better personality, but then again, a lot of times they don't have that interacting personality. Uh, one of the things in my career uh, early in the years, I used to be scared to turn work down. So I would double book, double dipping, you know, make double the money. That was the craziest thing ever done because one, if the schedule changes a little bit, now you're going to mess up the show that's anticipating you to be there in three hours. And it, it, it's a snowball. It's going to roll into a big chaos 
you know, you're going to crash and burn. Thank God that's never happened to me. Uh, but it's very, very stressful. Plus LA traffic. You just don't know if there's going to be an accident or road construction, whatever. So I finally said, okay, forget it. I want to help the show out my client. If they need a photographer and it has to be a union photographer, I'm going to refer them one of my friends. Hopefully that will gain some points with them because I'm referring somebody plus to get healthcare and stuff. You have to have so many hours. So my friend then would end up getting some hours for his health care and his family. And then I can continue doing what I'm doing. Well, at first I was very insecure about that, but it was the best thing I could ever do, Richard. And again, I say this with the most complete, humble heart. What ended up happening is the few photographers I would recommend the next time that show needed a photographer and they said, oh, we're so glad you're available because so-and-so was so high maintenance or he was too slow. He, he wasn't quick like you were. And just all these all these different issues that I don't think anything of because of my experience. And then it just made me that much more valuable. You, you, you shared two important lessons there that I don't, not everybody might pick up. So I want to hammer them home. One is, is be there and present for the job. So if you're trying to spread yourself too thin, then you can't be there. And when the client needs you, that can be frustrating. So in the world of video production, so many things can go wrong, especially with outdoors or the light changes. And so if you're not present, you won't succeed. And then the other one, I imagine karma is real. You know, you give good referrals out, you refer good people when you can't be there. They appreciate that. But then you'll pick up work yourself, right? Like those people will refer work back to you when they're too busy. Yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. It makes it, you know, a lot of people don't get it, but, you know, denying yourself, you'll always gain, but it doesn't make sense to do that, you know? Uh, but in fact, I'm, I'm living proof that it does. It, it is. And you get a good reputation. And uh, again, in a, in a, you can't see my big smile when I tell you this, but a few years ago, the production coordinator on NCIS went to me and said, Mike, you're always busy. Is it because you're that good? And I laughed and I said, sir, it's not that I'm that good. Everyone else sucks, you know, and uh, I don't I don't say that with an ego. But like I said, some of these guys have been doing it for so long and they they bring in an attitude. They bring in issues. And it's like, you know what? They booked you for you get an eight hour minimum. You might only be there for two hours. So just enjoy the time you're there. And when it's your turn to play, play and play good. Win the game. Now, you, you work on some interesting shows with tremendous variety. Um, how do you find yourself keeping up on all of these skills? Because, you know, on a TV show, you might need to be making the family portrait and then the mug shot and then the corporate ID shot and all of these, then the product photo. How do you keep yourself versed in all of these genres? What are some of your tricks to studying or emulation so you can do all these different styles? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but I was actually a wedding photographer. I started in 1980. So I learned how to work with people, interacting with people and posing people uh, from shooting weddings and doing portraits. And then as I started, when I got in the union, started working television more often, I already knew how to pose people. I was a commercial photographer. I held some pretty big accounts, Litton Industries, uh, from Aerospace and Simple Green. So I, I know the commercial aspect to it. I think a lot of it is... I started shooting, I was going to school in the 70s. So I wasn't just a photographer shooting people. I shot products. I shot weddings. I did journalism. I did sports. I won a few sports awards. Uh, so my background is very extensive. Uh, and it's just the love for photography. Now, I personally now I love shooting people because you get to interact, but there are times you're, you have to photograph, uh, product placement, um, because of, you know, they're sh we're shooting a movie and there's a certain jacket that they're giving to the main actor and they want to see their product on the main actor. So you have to take a second and say, okay, he looks good. The jacket's looking good. So shoot this for the prop for the company who's providing the jacket. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's not just always an action you know, shooting the actor in the middle of a fight isn't going to really show off their jacket. So you have to know what to do and things like that. Know what it is, the, how the photo is going to be used. You bring up an interesting concept there, though, which is that I think a lot of photographers trap themselves into one or two genres. They feel like if they're not known for one thing, 
then how are they going to become famous or how are they going to become successful? And while I think there's an advantage to having a specialty, you seem to point the case to um, having diversity of skills makes you more employable. And then it's your professional reputation that leads to having the constant work. Skill will get you in the door, but character will keep you in the room. And there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. We're all familiar with the Parthenon in Greece, the Acropolis, the big structure with all the pillars. And I mean, it's still standing to this day. And the marketing guy I was listening to, he said, you have to take your business and you don't want to just establish it like one pillar. I'm a portrait photographer. That's all I do because you're not going to there's no stability in that. But if one pillar is wedding photography, the other pillar is people you know, portraits. Another one is environmental portraits. Another one might be the baby things or the boudoir things. Now, all of a sudden you have five or six pillars holding your business. So when it's not wedding season, you have the the baby thing or the boudoir thing, or you have different pillars holding your business. And I always found that fascinating. So even though I'm refined and I work in television, Uh, and movies, I know how to pose people. If I have to do a wedding shot, I know how to do that because I've, I've shot weddings professionally for 19 years. Occasionally, like I said, you have to shoot a product. I have to shoot action. I've, I've done it. I've done it at a professional level. So I never really turned anything down. There was a gentleman I went to school with back in the seventies. We were in college together and he used to have the attitude "Oh, she's not pretty. I'm not shooting her. I'm like, what are you saying, man? I go, I'm shooting weddings and stuff that you detest, but I'm driving a Porsche and you're driving a Volkswagen, you know? Uh, So I I guess it just depends on how hungry you are. Everything's an experience. You know, I I don't usually say, oh, I'm not going to shoot that because I don't want to do that. And that's no fun. You know what? No, it's an experience. Try to do it and implement it. Have fun with it. So as you're building that relationship and you're building your professional reputation, what are some of the important things to consider? Is it referrals? Is it taking the time to keep your portfolio up to date? What are some of the things that, you know, will help that photographer stay busy consistently? What's been successful for you? What's been important? Being humble. Believe it or not, being humble. And I have a, uh, this, this is a good and bad thing. It's kind of a curse and it's, it's, it's not, I, I'm not saying go out and buy all the new top gear, you know, the equipment. On the other hand, if you need to shoot, if you're going to shoot portraits regularly, then go get a nice portrait prime lens. Don't, there's a photographer uh, in our industry who's, who's a friend of mine, and he always has the top of the line Nikon camera and all the glass. But when he has to set up lights or a backdrop, his stands are shot. He has to get tape to tape his stands together. And it, and it, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. He'll drop $8,000 on camera gear and he won't drop $60 on a darn stand. Uh, when I go in there, my, my equipment uh, is, is, is on top of the line. I mean, it's good stuff. I don't have, I'm required to purchase a piece of equipment and I know I'm going to need it regularly. I don't hesitate buying it. Now, with that said, I'm not, I don't always buy top of the line equipment because I don't think it's necessary. Uh, my strobe package of choice are the Paul C. Buff strobes, the DigiBees. Uh, are they the big, you know, name stuff? No, but the customer service is fantastic. And uh, most people would never know it. You, you buy equipment that you feel comfortable with and that you know, and that's going to hold up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always, you know, I'm always evaluating gear and we'll try something out or rent something and make sure I like it before I invest in it. But I I learned that lesson early on. You know, I'm the tripod and ball head that I've had now is 15 years old and it's just as good as the day I bought it because I I, I learned after buying three cheap ones that they lasted about three years each. Right. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And not only that, if you take care of your equipment and you upgrade People want to buy your used equipment because they know it's in good shape. Yeah. You know, so that that's also important, just taking care of your equipment. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, we can't go to trade shows anymore, but uh, there's a lot of information out there on the uh, you know Internet. You know what? The Black, the Black Rapid camera straps that holds two cameras. Uh, I think I'm going to buy one for this upcoming project I'll be working on. 
and I hope it works. But I, I've always hated ca uh, cameras bouncing around my hips. Because yeah. when you're working on a tight set, the lens all of a sudden hits the wall or something, that just drives me nuts. And I just always hand hold the camera I was shooting with and then excuse myself from the set, grab the other camera and come back on. And that's always worked for me, but I just... Not now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Now you need to keep everything with you and under your control the whole time. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, we're going to see how that works. Well, that's the nice thing is, is, you know, we do live in a world where it's possible to try out gear and referrals go a long way. You also have brought up a few times having photo buddies, friends that you could talk to. Yes. I think a lot of photographers, I see two types of conversations happen with photographers. One is, is that they get into online arguments all the time and they don't form close relationships with, with peers. And so one is... I, you know, it's great to be involved, like Photo Focus as an online community. And I think that opportunity to interact with others and get feedback on your work is critical, but you still need to form some solid relationships yes. with people that can challenge you, people that you could bounce ideas off of. And you can't be afraid that they might not always like your work. Like sometimes they might be critical of your work and you need that, right? Uh, well, without a doubt. You can't, if you, if you implement an ego, you're in the wrong business. You know, I mean, you're just, everybody, you know, it's so subjective. Why did you shoot it this way? Why didn't you frame it that way? How come you light it this way? How come you didn't add more shadow? Why did you, there's no detail in the shadow. Why didn't you put a reflector? Hey, you know what? That's the way I did it. And that's the way they approved it. And uh, the cool thing is I'm coming back to work for them again. But thank you for your information. You know, next time I'll, I'll, I'll try this reflector or I'll try that. But no ego. There's no, you can't have an ego because if you think you're, you're that good, you're not going to be working that long. Uh, and you're right. Relationships are huge. What do you think of this? I tried something new. What do you, have you ever tried something like this? You, you got to bounce those ideas off of other people that you respect all the time. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's good to have peers and, you know, form those meaningful relationships so you can get that feedback. Well, this is very helpful. Mike, as people are getting back to work here, you know, do you have any practical advice or, you know, things to help people sort of regain that confidence as they get back to shooting? You know, we, we've all had more time off than we'd like. We might feel a little bit rusty. Uh, anything as you sort of have uh, gotten back to work that really helped you feel confident and that you were ready to jump in and, and get to work full time again? One of the things I've always been is being proactive instead of reactive. I knew things were starting up. There's a project I knew about for a, almost a year and a half. And I was just constantly contacting the, the producer that I've worked with in the past. And no, no reply, no reply. And he's busy and I don't expect him to reply every time. And then the few times I would talk to him, he'd say, well, go talk, talk to so-and-so. He's overseeing this part. So then I would call him up and says, no, no decision's been made yet. And they're just kind of stringing you along. I found out that they're going to use the same publicity crew uh, team from the, the, the major studio. So I said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to them. I reached out to them and reintroduced myself. They knew exactly who I was. Uh, they were very familiar with the work that I've done with the movie prior to. So they sent me an email a week later saying, you're hired. We want you. Then the funny thing is a couple of days later, the producer calls me up and says, are you available? I said, no, oh, yeah, I just talked to so-and-so and they just booked me. And he, I think he was a little taken back. He said, what do you mean they booked you? And I told him, well, you told me that you don't handle that part anymore. And that the other guy said, he's not doing it anymore. So I figured, well, I'll go to the publicists. <laughs> and and he, 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 I don't think he was mad at me. He was probably impressed that I was proactive. It, it, sh it showed that you wanted the gig. And that exactly. You were... and, and I told him, and I never, 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 never in my attitude was like, well, the heck with you. I'm just going to overstep you. It was never like that at all. It was like, well, this is what you told me. So this is what I did. And uh, it worked out. I got the job. He's happy. I'm happy. The publicists are happy. So be proactive. I, I've never been the type of wait till they call you because you'll, you're you going to wait and wait and wait. And unless you got a big budget on marketing uh, and promotions, you know, you have to cold call. You, you got to let them know. You got to keep the feelers out there. And hey, how you doing? What's going on? Okay, I'm leaving a voice message. I'm sorry you're not there, but 
you know, it's your favorite photographer. Remember me? And you, and you can't you can't take a rejection as a rejection. I mean, no, 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 no. because oh, they might God. they might not need you that day, or they might not need you this month. But right. you still have to keep in touch. I mean, now if they really don't want you, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to just say, "Are we a bad fit for each other?" Or you know, are you not? Are you truly not interested? Should I stop calling? But what I found is is that keeping those relationships open and just expressing interest needs will come up. Maybe the person they use all the time is suddenly not available. Well, you become the number two and you get your foot in the door. Oh, you're not kidding. As if, if, if one thing we all hate is rejection. So here I am. I'm, I, I know that there's this movie coming out with Jeremy Camp, a, a Christian uh, singer. And it's like, okay, guys, you're the man. You're going to be the guy. You're going to shoot our movie and this is going to happen. And like, okay, let me know when, let me know when, let me know when. The next thing you know, I'm watching Facebook. And there's Jeremy Camp. Hey, today's the first day of production, and here I am in Alabama, and, and I'm watching. My heart sunk. Why aren't I there? What did I do? Who did I piss off? So then after kind of getting back to my wits, after being hurt, I mean, rejection sucks. Uh, I called a couple friends. And I said, hey, did you hear anything? Did I say something? Because I've been known to put my foot in my mouth. And they said, no, no, no. And they were even laughing. Say, no, Mike, don't, I just, that's just the way it goes. So I called the producer back and I said, hey, did I do something wrong on the last project? Or did I say something that offended somebody? Was my work not sufficient? And he laughed at me. Richard, the dude laughed in my face. And I'm like, what's going on? He said, Mike, we just finished the project before that you worked on. And we made millions of money tons of money the producing company threw lots of money at us and we had to sign a contract for five more movies so when it was come time to start this new movie uh the i still believe movie that was released uh, uh, almost a year ago the one of the uh publicists asked me to do a favor his friends trying to get into the photography union and he wanted to know if he can work on the movie and he laughed and he said, and so what am I supposed to do, Mike? These guys gave us millions of dollars. And what am I supposed to say? No, I can't. And I said, all right, you know what? I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. Thank you very much. And thanks for letting me know when I called you, my name came up, you answered it. You talked to me. I appreciate it. That just solidifies my friendship with you. Thank you. And that's that honest, that's that honest discussion of sometimes we're not going to be the perfect fit for every job, but you, you just got to be honest. No, but this is where it gets good. A week later. He says, are you still available? I said, yeah, of course I'm still available. We're on hiatus. He said, well, the guy didn't work out. His personality on the set didn't gel with the other camera department, you know, guys. How quick can you get here? And I said, well, when do you want me? He says, the flight leaves in six hours. <laughs> My wife and I, that's one of our crazy stories about this glamorous life of ours. It isn't glamorous at all. Yes. So uh, then I end up working on the movie. But it's, the, it's just dealing with that type of relationship. It's been crazy. It's 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 crazy. So, Mike, to sort of close things out, we you know we've been talking about the value of relationships, of keeping those professional relationships going. You had some advice that was shared with you once, I think, about maintaining relationships and how to get those doors open. Anything you want to share? Yes, a very very good friend of mine, I've worked with on about five movie projects, was doing a Zoom broadcast to a bunch of uh, upcoming uh, production people. And he said something I thought was so perfect, if I may. He says, listen to this. The biggest weakness is going to someone for favors before relationships. Don't go asking to do something or handing a business card that goes to their secretary and in the trash because it communicates, I want something. Instead, make it about the relationship. Say, hey, I love what you do. And I want to get to know why you do it. Let me treat you to a coffee sometime. When there's a relationship, it's not about what I can get. It's about what we can do together. Sometimes it takes years to tap that connection for a favor. But just focus on building relationships first. When there's a relationship, you're not looking for favors. You're looking for collaborations. I thought that was so powerful. I asked him, can I use that quote? for different you know, things when I'm teaching or sharing with others and, and trying to encourage people. And he said, oh, please go do, use it. 
And I found that to be so, so true. You know, it, I want to work with somebody I can get along with. Maybe you're not quite that good, but doggone it, you are a lot of fun and energy on the set. And I bet you'll get hired for that instead. So relationships. Well, that's great advice to maintain the relationships you have and the clients you want to work with and keep expressing that desire. I always say that when given the choice, people choose to work with people they like and respect. And so taking the time to form those relationships, taking the time to express your interest in those projects and to maintain those relationships is really that foundation for a long career. Mike, this is very helpful. I appreciate you sharing some of the advice as we're getting back to work from COVID, as well as some of the things that have helped keep you successful and on set working for many years. Uh, very practical. If people want to see some of your photography, where's a good place for them to look up your images? My website is uh, the numeral four, the word stills, fourstills.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram at uh, hashtag Mike for stills. Great. Uh, and, and yeah, they can see, you know, a lot of what, uh, what I've done and what I'm doing. Excellent. Well, folks, I encourage you to check that out. And just a lot of super practical advice here on how to have a long and successful career, as well as how to get back to work right now, some of the challenges you're going to face. So Mike, thanks for making the time. My pleasure, Richard. Thank you. The Photo Focus podcast publishes every week, so be sure to subscribe and you'll hear from different great guests who want to help you get inspired and learn more about photography. Also, this is your last chance to enter the Photo Focus 21st Anniversary Contest. We're giving away cameras, gift cards, all sorts of prizes. In fact, more than $10,000 worth of photo gear is up for grabs. Be sure to head on over to Photo Focus and get signed up before it's too late. My name's Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of PhotoFocus.com, and I appreciate you listening to our podcast. Please be sure to leave a review and consider forwarding this episode to a friend. Thanks again. Thanks again.